right, perfect. Um, all right, hi everyone. Welcome to the um, session uh, about farm tech. And uh, we'll also cover a case that you guys signed up for as well. Uh, I'm Leanne. I'm the program director at North Seattle College Farm Tech Program. I'm actually a pharmacist by training and a physician assistant as well. Um, and uh, really enjoy the healthcare field. Uh, been practicing uh, for the past 20 years uh, in uh, pharmacy and in academia. So it's been sort of a fun mix uh, of my past career so far. Um, I'd like to encourage all of you who are here. Uh, let me and let me scroll through my Zoom pages of people. Uh, I'd like to encourage everyone who's here here to like um, turn on your camera and uh, sort of uh, you know be a part of the uh, session today, so we can have a good time. Uh, I hope to involve sort of your feedback and sort of get into the case and like talk about our our friend here in this case, uh, and also talk about the field of pharmacy as well. So uh, feel free to turn your cameras on. Feel free to um, unmute. Is that I don't know if that's okay. Is that how it works, Chloe? In this uh, session, unmute and ask questions. And you can use the chat box too. We have someone who's going to work on the chat box, and then um, we can also have a time for questions, um, especially when we go through the case together. So, all right. Well, let's just uh, move along here. Welcome, my little graphic here. Ha ha. Um, this is kind of a slow um, animation, but you're probably in this session because you have some kind of interest in some kind of future, maybe pharmacy or any healthcare career, and maybe you want to find out how to get started. Um, well, I think you're at the right place. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about like what is the ph pharmacy field like, uh, what types of pharmacies are out there, like where could you actually work, and who employs pharmacists and pharmacy technicians. Uh, then we will talk about the money. Um, money is a big question and a good point to talk about as well. And then we'll also talk about how to get started. But interdispersed in all of this, we'll also have fun with some trivia and also go through the case of unintentional overdose. Uh, so if you uh, haven't already, make sure to have your kits out so we can dive into that. I wanna like talk about pharmacy and then in intermittently we'll go over the case. So try to keep things Keep it keep you on your toes actually. All right, I think we're ready for some trivia first. Okay. Um, here's our first trivia. Uh, I want you guys to tell me what do all these have in common? You can dump it in the chat. Uh, you can go ahead and unmute and say it. You can act it out, whatever. Any ideas what these all might have in common? Um, Ashley says sodium. Okay, that's a good idea, sodium. There is some sodium in all of these usually, or a little bit, at least in the prescription drug, there can be sodium in there for sure. Um, any other ideas? We have our Coke can. We have a pharmacy pill bottle with pills in it. Uh, we have a Dr. Pepper and a Pepsi. Well, okay, other than the fact that maybe they all contain some sugar, right? Um, you know, Coke, Pep, Dr. Pepper and Pepsi is our fun pop here is loaded with sugar. Um, but actually even medications contain sugar too, right? Um, and they all probably contain some kind of a drug or medication, right? Um, the prescription has medication in it. And then the soda pops, um, the ones pictured here have caffeine. Um, but actually, did you know that a lot of our common sodas were created by pharmacists actually? So our Coke here was uh, invent or put together by John Pemberton back in the 1880s um, and he kept it on sale for five cents a glass as a soda fountain pharmacy drink. Um, so that was our Coke here. What about our Pepsi? 
So Mr. Caleb Bradham, he is the guy who invented Pepsi and uh, he called it or coined it Brad's drink. How original, right? At his pharmacy back in 1893. And the other pop here that's probably more well known as having been invented by a pharmacist is the Dr. Pepper. Charles Alderton, he made Dr. Pepper back in 1880. He called it liquid sunshine. And I don't know if you notice, I don't know, Dr. Pepper has a really unique taste and kind of a smell to it. I, I always thought it was really unique. Um, but he made the drink to take after uh, the way he thought his pharmacy smelled. Very interesting, right? <laughs> a drink that smells like your pharmacy. Um, and lastly, the prescription bottle here with the prescription medicine. Um, ben Franklin was actually the founder of pharmacy in the U.S., uh, amongst his other things that he's done, he's the guy who created the first separate sort of dedicated pharmacy space here in the U.S. Uh, back in the mid 1700s. All right, so that's our trivia. First one, first go at it. Um, so what is pharmacy? Uh, pharmacy is a place where we dispense meds. Obviously, we work with pills. Um, in the you know long term care or like outpatient setting pharmacy. Um, and then we work with IVs, which are intravenous meds, uh, like you see this person in a, in a hood at the pharmacy, at an inpatient pharmacy, making up an IV uh, in the hospital. Uh, and if you're a farm tech, you're actually the one who's mixing these IVs in a fancy sterile hood. Uh, and this is a close up here. Uh, they're drawing up med into an IV syringe, and they're probably going to put it into that piggyback there hanging in the, in the hood in the picture. Um, and all these sort of IV solutions are put together so that patients can receive their treatments. Uh, also a really neat side of pharmacy includes the joy of like cooking, who likes cooking here or following a recipe. Uh, did you know you can actually get a job in pharmacy uh, where you get to cook meds? Hold on, the right picture is coming here. <laughs> there she is. Um, you actually get to cook meds. Uh, you, you use a recipe and you make stuff. So you would make like suppositories, capsules, creams, ointments, tinctures, eye drops. Um, uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, trochees, all kinds of different formulations of medicine that you would make at the pharmacy. Uh, this scale here is actually filling molds uh, for suppositories. Uh, so we make these kinds of custom made medicines for patients who maybe can't swallow pills or um, maybe sometimes patients um, can't use the prescribed dose that's available commercially. So we can custom make them into a dose that fits that patient. And here's another tech, a farm tech actually, who is uh, throwing some cream through a machine called an unguator. And the unguator is basically a really fancy machine that uh, mixes the solutions and the uh, creams to make it uh, mix with the medicine that's in it together nice and smoothly. So pharmacy is also a place where we do a lot of education about medicine and health. Um, so, you know, I don't know how many of you know someone who takes this many medications. <laughs> I certainly hope you don't know anyone who takes this many medications, okay? Uh, but I have met a few patients who take this many. Um, but can you imagine being the one to have to go through all this medicine as a patient, maybe your family member or a friend, and trying to figure out what med to take at what time of day, at what dose, uh, for what symptom? It can be mind boggling. Uh, so as a farm tech and as a pharmacist, you would be involved in the education piece of helping patients figure out how to take their meds correctly. Um, and it's really important because millions of pe people die every year from mistakes related to having too many medications at home. Uh, so really being that expert in pharmacy knowledge is really um, a stepping sort of a starting point for patients to really figure out how to keep themselves health healthy. Pharmacy is also a place where we do a lot of work with billing, with the healthcare system, uh, with making medication affordable to patients. Um, this can actually be a very rewarding aspect of pharmacy. You don't think about it right away because you think about pills and IVs and hospitals and you know sterile gowns and, and maybe making medicine. But we do a lot involving like the, the money part of it. Um, 
And we can really make a big difference in a patient's life by getting them the treatment they need, but they could not afford. So that's a huge piece of our job here too. And then lastly, pharmacy is a place that we connect with the community. Uh, if you think about it, uh, pharmacies are very accessible in the community. Um, you don't need an appointment to go see a pharmacist or a pharmacy, right? You can just walk in anytime. Uh, and it's also a nice place for the community to gather and engage with healthcare professionals. Um, and you can really make a lasting impact in the community. Um, I worked at an HIV specialty pharmacy for many years. It was called Bioscript on Capitol Hill. And I had the privilege of working with just really a local AIDS service organization called Lifelong. Um, and really it was such a rewarding time to meet um, a wide demographic of patients and help the HIV community um, and really just um, go like head first into that community and make a big difference and help them with their meds, help them with side effects, help them with social economic stuff. So help them with their bills and reading their bills or getting their mail sorted out, just all kinds of fun stuff and fun ways to get and engage uh, more deeply with your patients and the community. So, all right, let's now dive into our case because pharmacy is all about medicine, right? Uh, and currently there are over like 20,000 FDA approved medications on the market. Uh, and that's, that's crazy, right? That's a lot of medications. Um, but let's take a closer look at one of the medications uh, in our case here. So if you haven't already, please take out your case and it should look something like this. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. It's hard to show something on this screen when you have a background filter, but ah, there you go. <laughs> so uh, take, it out, take it out and then we're gonna read the case together, okay? So here we go, the case. I'm gonna start on the top here. So two days ago, this is our patient who's coming in to see us or we're gonna read about him here. Uh, two days ago, a 14 year old Luis uh, felt like he was coming down with the flu and he had trouble sleeping. So he took some over the counter medicines for his headache, cold symptoms and some insomnia. I'm sure all of you have felt some of these symptoms before. Over-the-counter medicines are legal drugs that can be purchased without a prescription from a doctor. So over-the-counter means you walk into the pharmacy or Fred Meyer or QFC and that area in front of the pharmacy where all those like Tylenol and Advil and, you know, Gas-X and all that stuff next to the toothpaste, that's all over-the-counter medications, okay? They can be purchased by anybody. Now today at school, Luis started to feel nauseous and started vomiting. Now his stomach hurt, he started sweating excessively, <clears throat> and his heart felt like it was racing. So Luis's science teacher noticed that the whites of his eyes and his skin were yellowish, and he insisted that Luis go to the school nurse. So the nurse called Luis's parents, and they told him that he should go directly to the ER nearby. Okay, so now Luis is at the ER. Dun, dun, dun. So in this part one, I can't even show you this paper nicely here. Um, they want us to find and identify the five symptoms Luis is experiencing at school. Does anyone have some ideas? What, how is Luis feeling? What are some symptoms? Nice, I see someone said uh, tired. So he is feeling tired. Um, good, what else, does, what else is he feeling like? From the second paragraph, it says, today at school, Luis began feeling nausea, good job. He's feeling nauseated, which really means sick to your stomach. Um, then it says he started vomiting, another symptom, right? So nauseated, vomiting, what else? We got fever in the chat from Maria. Nice. He has a fever, possibly, especially because his, well, he's sweating, his heart is racing, um, his stomach hurt. Okay. Uh, needless to say, he is not feeling good. Okay. And there are at least five symptoms that we could record on this patient record at the ER. Okay. So you're working at the ER here and you're going to write these symptoms down for our friend Luis. 
And the question too asks us, they want us to consider, do you think Luis, our friend, has a stomach flu? And if you think so, you could say yes or no or why. We also got pain um, in the chat for another symptom. Yeah, nice. He is having stomach pain. That is correct. So you guys think he has a stomach flu? What should we diagnose him with? It's your day to be ER doctor. <laughs> I, I, I see a no. No, we should not diagnose him with stomach flu. Okay. Um, how about others? Do you, do you say no too? Do you agree with your friend? Well, no is probably right. I think the question is a little leading, misleading or leading here. <laughs> no is probably right. Um, what, like, how would you know it was stomach flu? Because some of the symptoms could, you know, could overlap with stomach flu symptoms, right? Oh, I see someone says, um, I think Luis has a stomach ache, but I'm not sure. And that's a very good answer too. He does have a stomach ache for sure. Um, cause stomach flu can cause the nausea, vomiting, uh, you can feel, you can be, you can be feverish. You'll probably feel tired. Um, but there are some other symptoms here that are kind of interesting. Like he has yellow skin and yellow eyes, and that doesn't typically happen with a stomach flu. And so that makes me think that probably, um, probably it's not just a stomach flu, even if he had a stomach flu, you know what I mean? So, Okay. Well, that's part one for us. Well, let's, we're an ER doctor here today, I guess. So we're gonna do a little more work than just uh, guess here. Let's go ahead and um, think about our symptom that Luis, our friend had. He has these yellow eyes and yellow skin, right? And in the medical world, we call that symptom jaundice. So it's called jaundice. And jaundice happens because we have something, we have too much of something called bilirubin in our blood. Um, and as you can see here by this cartoon with the liver in the middle, with the big, angry, upset, sick looking face, okay? Um, jaundice can happen from, for a variety of reasons. You know, you can have an infection that can cause jaundice or liver disease or a digestive problem or medications can cause jaundice. Um, gallstones can cause jaundice. And so there's a lot of causes for jaundice here that can happen for many reasons. At this ER, we're a good ER. So we're going to do our lab tests now. So what's really neat is that you are not only the ER doctor today, you're going to be the lab tech too. It's like you've got many degrees all at once before you even graduated high school. It's awesome, right? So Take out your kit and uh, in your kit, you should have like these Ziploc baggies. Uh, this one has the three test tubes with some liquid in it. Take that out. And then you should have a tube with these two orange papers in it called the ALT enzyme test paper. Then you should have these three plungers that are empty and unused that say, uh, blood plasma, bilirubin solution, and albumin test solution on it, okay? So take all these things out of your kit. I'll give you a minute. And then I also want you to take out your laboratory test sheet. Oh, geez, let me put it right in front of my body so you can see it. There you go. Your laboratory test sheet, which has three big circles on it, and it's in this chart, okay? And then you wanna take out your color charts for laboratory tests, okay? If you have all this out, when you do, can you give me a virtual thumbs up or an actual real thumbs up or something to show me that you got your stuff out of your kit and you are ready to go? We have one more question comment. Um, oh, yes. Could he, sounds like he's asking, could he drink more water to cure this? Hmm. You know, more water is a cure for a lot of things. <laughs> um, 
you know, possibly he could drink some water. He is vomiting, though. I'm not sure how long that water would stay down. I'd be concerned about that. But that is a good idea because water does help a lot of things. And people do get sick when they're too, de too dehydrated, which means not enough water in the body. All right, so um, I saw one thumbs up here. Um, have you guys had a chance? Oh, I see another one, nice, thank you. And another, oh, that was the same one. Anybody else? Are you ready for our fun lab test? Now you're, you're putting on your new hat, you're the lab technician now. Yay, yay, okay, I see some, Thumbs up in the chat as well. All right, perfect. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna perform this lab test, okay? So if you open this baggie, you're gonna take out the tube that has the clear solution first. And that says our friend Luis Cordera's blood plasma, okay? Let's take this out first. All right, so we're gonna use this blood plasma. We're gonna take our plunger that says Luis Cordero's blood plasma, they match, right? Tube and plunger match. We're gonna open the tube. Now hold the bottom carefully so you don't dump his plasma all over the table here, okay? We do have one person asking if we can wait a couple of minutes. Uh, oh, okay. We can, uh, let's, let's uh, pause for about a minute or two and talk about um, plasma here. All right, so as you notice, we're using this uh, specimen called Luis Cordero's blood plasma, okay? Now, what is blood plasma? Uh, blood plasma, as you can see on my screen, is this pale yellow liquid that made up of like 50, that makes up 55% of your blood. So half of your blood is blood plasma, okay? And in this plasma, uh, your water, your salt, nutrition, enzymes, proteins, uh, are suspended in the plasma, okay? And that's what we're gonna use today to test Luis Cordera's blood and to see what is going on with our friend, okay? Why does he have all these symptoms? So let's give our friend here some time. Um, so you've taken out your data table, your lab test sheet, color charts, and six small tubes. Find a clean space to work. Um, I do have to tell you, please don't eat any of these specimens. Um, they're not gonna taste good anyway, so don't, don't even try it. Um, and we're gonna be the lab techs here. So let's see here. A question in the chat as well. Um, Amor is asking, can we create plasma with chemicals? Can we create plasma with chemicals? That's a good question. Um, I'm not aware of synthetic plasma. Um, we, we can give patients, uh, you know, sodium chloride, which is like water hydration, which is what plasma is, a lot of it's made of, a lot of water. We can give patients proteins and we can give them some enzymes. Uh, we can give them nutrition and we can give them hormones. So all of the ingredients in a plasma, uh, most of it we can give to a patient. Uh, intravenously. That means through that IV tube into the body. Um, but I don't know of an actual like synthetic plasma that has all of it in it and ready to go. Let's see the time here. Um, maybe we can go on. How about everyone who has your stuff out, just leave it right there, okay? Let's move on to another slide and we'll come back to this, okay? Just so that our friend can join us here. So hold on, I'm gonna advance through some slides and you're gonna see a bunch of like flashing lights in your face. Um, let's talk a little bit about pharmacy then, okay? So if you were a farm tech, now let's take off the lab tech hat because you were at the ER. Now we're back as a student here. <laughs> we'll talk about if you might work as a farm tech, like where would you work? Um, and 
you actually might even work at an ER. A lot of farm techs work in the ER to do something called med medication reconciliation. You take a medication history from a patient to make sure that their medicines align with what they're actually taking so that when they stay at the hospital, that we give them the right meds. Um, but what, where, what else or where else might you work as a farm tech? Uh, the most visible is probably your retail pharmacies that you see down your street or maybe out your window. Uh, your Walgreens, Bartels, QFC, Rite Aid, CVS, Safeway, all those places. And those are considered retail or community pharmacies. We also have independents uh, that are not part of these big corporations, but they kind of fall under the retail community side. Then you have the hospital pharmacy, and that's where pharma techs actually like compound or put together IV medications that we'll use on patients who are staying in the hospital. Most often these patients have a hard time either swallowing or they can't eat for whatever reason, or they're not allowed to eat for a particular reason, and they need some kind of medicine and nutrition via IV. There's also an outpatient pharmacy at the hospital where you know, patients who are leaving out the hospital go to the outpatient pharmacy. And on their way out, they stop by the pharmacy to get their meds, probably meds that they you know, started while they were in the hospital, like an antibiotic, if they had some kind of surgery or pain pills for a surgery, they'll get these meds on their way out of the hospital at the outpatient pharmacy. Then there's something called a long-term care pharmacy. Uh, these pharmacies cater to nursing homes and adult uh, stay living sort of settings. Um, and we, at this pharmacy, we do a lot of blister packing or bingo card packing or compliance packaging, they call it. And we put all these pills or doses into these little bubble packs to make the meds really easy for a patient to take or a nurse to administer. Um, and that's a really kind of neat niche part of pharmacy that's really growing a lot in our area. And I mentioned already the ER department. There are farm techs at the ER and they are taking care of new patients coming through the ER and getting their accurate medication histories from the patients themselves. A lot of farm techs work at insurance companies. Um, and so if you are more inclined to like a desk job or a nine to five job, you don't wanna deal with the hospital schedule of coming on the weekends and working nights and mornings, or you don't wanna do long-term care stuff, you can work at an insurance company. Uh, you could be in charge of um, helping the pharmacist design like the, the list of drugs that they're going to cover for that plan or managing things called like prior authorizations for meds and special things like that. Uh, so it can be a, a, a neat niche part of pharmacy. And lastly, I already talked about this earlier, but if you like cooking, compounding pharmacy is probably the way to go. It's a really fun place where you get to make a lot of meds and you can do a lot of actually fun experiments there too. Okay, I think we're at the five minute mark. Uh, I'm gonna go back to the, let's go back, rewind guys, become a lab tech again. Do do do. I can't do any fun music or uh, sounds. Um, all right, so now we're the lab tech again. So go back to your lab stuff, take out your friend Luis Cordera's plasma in the tube and the plunger. And we're going to go ahead and open the tube carefully without spilling all the blood plasma everywhere. So you open it, then you're going to use the plunger. And to use the plunger, you want to squeeze the plunger head before you insert it into the liquid. Okay, then insert it while you keep it squeezed. And then you're going to draw up, let go of the plunger, and then you see the liquid come back up into the plunger here. So now if you see some kind of liquid line, in your plunger, you know you got some blood plasma. All right, now it's gonna take a little bit of uh, coordination. You wanna close your blood plasma with the finger that you have that's available. Snap it shut so you don't pour it all over your table. Now you're gonna put your lab test sheet on a, on a um, flat surface, okay? And then you see these three dots here? One, two, three. You're gonna drop two, do two drops of this blood plasma onto each circle. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. So two drops. I'm gonna do it while you're doing it too. One, two, one, two, and one, two. If you didn't have enough liquid in your syringe, you can always, or your plunger, you can always reopen the blood plasma. We wouldn't actually do this in an actual lab tech situation, but we can for today. And you're gonna open that and get some more of Luis's plasma 
and drop it into that circle, okay? On each of the three circles, that is correct. Now, once we have placed our friend's blood plasma onto each of the three circles, okay, we're gonna put the blood plasma and the plunger away so we don't get confused. You're gonna use a new plunger the one that says Billy Rubin test solution. Do you remember what Billy Rubin is? Remember that's the that's what's responsible for for causing that jaundice, that yellowing of our eyes and our skin. So open that tube here that has the Billy Rubin test solution in it. Use the appropriate Billy Rubin test solution plunger. Go ahead and draw some solution out of this. A couple questions from the chat. Yes. Um, first question is um, on each three circles. And then next question is, is it real plasma? And can you repeat what you put in the black plasma? OK, so yes, on each three circles, we should. I cannot hold up my circle because my paper, because I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to drip all the plasma off the paper. But on each of those three circles, you should have already dropped two drops of Luis Cordero's blood plasma on that paper, okay? Um, and it's not real plasma. It would be really fun if it was. Uh, we have to go through all kinds of protocols to get clear, clearance to have real bodily fluids in our hands today. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna do, do our best with this uh, simulated plasma here. And uh, can you repeat what you put in the black plasma? I'm not sure um, I understand. The black solution was the albumin test solution. So I hope you didn't put that on there yet. That's the black solution. We were, we haven't gotten to that yet. So going back, remember you have your Billy Rubin test solution here, the orange one. Okay, now we're gonna take this and drop two drops over the, the top circle that already has Luis Cordera's plasma on it, okay? Drop two on there, one, two. And yes, you wanna mix it. You can use that same Billy Ribbon test solution plunger to mix it. Okay. Then you can go ahead and put this plunger away so we don't mix things together that should not be mixed and close this orange tube that has the Billy Ribbon test solution. Now we're gonna to go to the next circle, the next one down that says albumin test plasma albumin test. And this is the one that has the black test solution in it, okay? It's hard to see in this camera. Go ahead and take the, you should only have one plunger that's clean left, called albumin test solution. Open the cap. Drop some solution. Drop two drops into that second circle there. And you can mix it around a little bit if you like. And then put your plunger away and cap your test solution. All right, and then you should be noticing some color changes happening before your eyes here. And we have these two strips of ALT enzyme test paper. Okay, I want you to take one of these papers out these orange papers, take one out. If you can get them apart, they're real sticky here. Ah, stuck together. Okay, and place this one strip of orange paper onto the bottom circle into Luis Cordero's blood plasma. As soon as you put the paper down and the plasma meets the paper, you should notice the plasma, the paper turns a certain color. All right, perfect. Now I wanna take, this paper out. This is your, hold on. This is your paper that is your color charts for laboratory tests. This is gonna be your like Bible, okay? To tell you your, what your results mean. So let's hold it next to our laboratory test sheet. All right, what, what color do we get when we mix the test solution with the, with the plasma for bilirubin? What color do we get? What did you guys get? One vote for dark green. Okay, we have a vote for dark green. 
two dark green. Two dark green. Hmm. Any other votes? Hmm. I'm not sure what to say because mine, mine is orange. <laughs> and I, let me see if I can show you this here. Hold on with my camera. Don't mind my mess here. I don't know if you can see this. It's hard to see the color here. Uh, you know the background that they make me maybe use. I can't even show you the paper here. <laughs> yeah, mine's orange. Uh, okay, interesting. How about um, how about our plasma albumin test? What color did you guys get for that one? This is the second bubble. The second bubble down the chart here. I see. I see one vote for orange. Is that for plasma albumin, guys? The second bubble? And then I see a blue, okay. I see another blue, okay. Nice, nice. All right, I got blue too. I got a really deep, dark blue. All right, and that means, if you look at our color chart test, that means that the plasma albumin is low. So most of us agree with that. Our tests show that his plasma albumin was low. Okay, uh, and albumin, just to give you a primer, albumin is a plasma protein. Remember how we talked about the fact that uh, plasma has protein in it? An albumin is a protein that is made by the liver. And when the liver is damaged, it can't make as much, okay? So then you would expect to have low levels of albumin when the liver is damaged. All right, what about, uh, the ALT enzyme test at the bottom here. What color did you guys get for that one? I think I saw a blue. Is that a new chat? I can't tell. I think that's the previous one. It's the previous one. Okay. What did you guys? What color did you guys get for the ALT enzyme test? That's the one where we put the paper, the strip of paper on. The circle. I think I see someone said dark green. Okay. Got a couple of dark greens. Dark greens. Okay. Okay. Um, mine's kind of a dark greenish bluish. Um, I think your dark green and my dark blue probably fits in the category of of high when you look at your chart here. Okay. And ALT is an enzyme. Okay, that helps the liver break down proteins. And excuse my, my, my Alexa. Um, and if the liver cells are damaged, it releases the ALT enzyme inside the liver cells. And if there's more damage, more ALT will escape the liver cells, right? So then you'd expect a higher amount of ALT in the blood. Okay, and that's what we tested for. So, so far we, we, did, we kind of disagreed on the bilirubin test, okay? I got the orange, you guys got the green. And on the plasma albumin test, we all sort of agreed that he has low plasma albumin. And for the ALT enzyme test, we all sort of agree that um, he has high ALT. And I think someone just put in the chat here that uh, they redid the bilirubin test and they got orange too. So um, there may have been some lab tech error going on today, uh, but I want you guys to get this sort of the main idea here that uh, uh, when we have liver injury, uh, we will end up with high, high bilirubin, okay, in this patient with these symptoms and low plasma albumin and high ALT, okay? Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so we got our, we did our lab tests. We, we did our duty as a lab technician today. We're getting to wear all kinds of hats here. Um, go ahead and if you want, or if you haven't already, go ahead and write your results into your 
data table. I think your data table is located at the back of your packet. You can go ahead and write in there whether you got the results. Uh, we got high plasma bilirubin, low plasma albumin, and high ALT enzyme test. Okay, and try to recall what we just said about what that means regarding our friend Luis's liver function based on the test that we just ran. Okay. So as you're filling that out, I want your brains to think with me here. What could be, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I guess we're getting a lot of packages today. Um, what do you think is causing his jaundice? Our friend, Luis, in the ER, what is causing his jaundice? Well, we could take a hint by looking at our data table and the results we got show us that there might be some liver injury going on, right? Yeah, I think uh, Omar said increase of bilirubin test, so it's high. So that could be causing his jaundice. Yes, you're very right. And the other two tests, the low albumin and the high ALT also points to some kind of liver injury process going on, okay? So now we're thinking our friend has jaundice because he has high bilirubin and his liver is possibly injured, okay? Now, the question number 20, which kind of asks the same question, which of these three tests provides the best evidence that Luis has liver damage, like actual liver injury? Which one do you guys think? Would it be the bilirubin test or the albumin test or the ALT enzyme test? One vote for Billy Rubin from Omar. Nice. I see one vote, one vote for Billy Rubin. Okay. How about others? Albumin. Okay, I have a vote for albumin. So let's remember bilirubin, um, high bilirubin can be, can be caused by a, a couple of things, uh, several things actually. And uh, bilirubin is something that can build up in the blood when the liver is not um, functioning well. And albumin is a protein that's made by the liver, right? Um, so it's a little bit of a tricky question, but uh, I think what we're looking for is actually the ALT enzyme test because the ALT enzyme lives inside of the liver cells. And when the liver is actually like damaged, the cell will basically like explode, okay, open up and die. And so it, it lets go of all the contents inside and the ALT enzyme, which was inside, you know, now gets into the bloodstream and that tells us the liver is actually damaged, okay? All right, let's, let's move along here. We talked about pharmacy, kind of out of order, but that's okay. Let's take a minute for some trivia, a real quick one. So our next trivia is about the most expensive drug in the world. It's made by a company named Novartis, and the drug is called Zolgensma, and it's a one-time infusion for a genetic condition called spinal muscular atrophy that occurs in early childhood. I think it's a second gene therapy approved for a genetic disorder. Um, let's take a guess at how much you think the most expensive drug in the world costs. What do you guys think? 300,000, 500,000, one mil, Two mil, three mil, one billion. Oh, nice. I got a vote for two mil and a vote for 300,000. Okay. I'm going to go for the answer now because we are running short on time here. Oh, oops. Um, 
So the correct answer is one dose of this drug costs a whopping $2.2 million. Now, luckily, it's a one-time treatment, and it's not a monthly infusion, okay? And the best news is that it seems to be working fairly well, saving a lot of lives of our kids um, who have this paralyzing genetic condition. So just putting that out there, I thought it was kind of a neat fact. Since we're talking about numbers, and let's turn back to our case, and now we're in part three here. I don't know if we're going to finish all the parts, but we'll get through as much as we can, okay? We need to figure out what caused our friend's liver damage, okay? Uh, we, we already agreed that there's some kind of liver process going on. So now the doctor, I'm going to read from part three. The doctor explained that knowing what liver, Luis's liver damage would help him select the best treatment for Luis. So the doctor asked Luis and his parents whether Luis had used alcohol, prescription medicines, over-the-counter medicines, or illegal drugs during the last few days. Then Luis, the patient, explained that he had only used over-the-counter medicines that were in his family's medicine cabinet. All he had taken in the last few days were medicines for his headache, his fever, flu symptoms, and some medicine to help him sleep. Luis also explained that he had been careful to read the directions and take only the dose that the label indicated. Okay, so if you look at question number one, it says Louis said he took two extra strength pain reliever caplets when he woke up. This is page five, guys. He took two of this extra strength pain reliever. This is the picture that's in your packet too. Uh, let me make it show up here. Ah, there you go. Okay, he took two of those in the morning when he woke up, two at lunchtime and two at dinner and two at bedtime. Okay, so if you look at this label here, you see that this extra strength pain reliever is 500 milligrams per caplet. So go ahead and let's see if you can calculate for me how many milligrams of acetaminophen, that is the ingredient in this extra strength pain reliever that he took. Remember, there's 500 milligrams in each caplet. He took two when he woke up, two at lunch, two at dinner, and two at bedtime. Do we have any calculations, some guesses, some estimates, some ideas? Um, okay. 4,000. 4,000 milligrams. Good job. Good job. So there we go. He took 4,000 milligrams of acetaminophen. So the next question is, did he follow the dosage instructions for extra strength pain reliever on the label? So look at your label. Go ahead and read it. What does it say? The directions is on the right hand side, the second box down. It says take two caplets every four to six hours as needed. Do not take more than eight caplets in 24 hours. So did he follow the directions? One vote for yes from Omar. Okay, I have a vote for yes. Do others agree with our friend here? Yeah, I feel like I agree. He, he followed the directions. He took a max of eight in a day. We don't know what time he took them exactly, but he, he followed the maximum dose per day. All right, so now we know how much acetaminophen he took from the pain reliever. Let's go to the next product. Turn the page, page six. We're going to look at the adult cold and flu formula. You'd be amazed at how many people take multiple meds at one time. And as you're going to find out, don't realize what's really in there. So adult cold and flu formula. He took two when he woke up, two at lunch, two at dinner, and two at bedtime. Okay. So if you look at the label for adult cold and flu, go ahead and find on there how much acetaminophen is in 
one capsule. Do you guys see that's in the top left corner of this page? So mine says 325 milligrams of acetaminophen for one capsule. Okay, so he took two and he woke up, two at lunch, two at dinner, and two at bedtime. So how much acetaminophen did he take? Okay, I have one answer for 1,950. Any other answers? This is a little more tricky than the other one. Okay. Uh-oh, I didn't, I didn't have the, ah, I didn't copy over the answer. Uh, the total should be 2,600, yes, 2,600 milligrams, uh, because one capsule is 325, two is 650, and if you do two capsules four times a day, the 650 times four gives you 2,600 milligrams. Yeah, he took it four times, four times uh, at, at, in the morning when he woke up, lunchtime, dinner, and then bedtime. Yeah, so now you get it, right? You have the right answer now. So did Louis follow the dosage instructions on the adult cold and flu formula? So if you look at this page, bottom right, there are some directions here. Did he follow it? Mine says, take two capsules every six hours and do not take more than eight capsules in any 24 hour period. What do you guys think? Did he follow the instructions? One vote for yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it looks like he kind of did, right? Right? A maximum of eight in a day. We don't know what exactly time he took it, if it was really six hours apart, but he took a total of eight in a day at the max. So, all right. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh oh. I did have it up. I had the wrong, wrong screen up here. Nighttime relief. This is uh, the third image you have of the OTC product, the over-the-counter product, nighttime relief for his insomnia. Remember he said he couldn't sleep? So he took nighttime relief here. I want you to look at the nighttime relief. Tell me, top left of the page, how much acetaminophen is in 15 mLs of nighttime relief? Good, 325 milligrams, you're right. So he took nighttime relief. He took 30 mLs at 10 p.m. And then he took another 30 mLs at 11 p.m., an hour later. So let's calculate how much acetaminophen Luis got from the nighttime relief. Um, Omar says 2,600. 2,600. Okay. Any other votes? This is a little tricky because it involves MLs. Um, but... 15 mLs or one tablespoon is 325 milligrams, like we said earlier, right? And then he takes a dose of two tablespoons, which is 30 mLs. So you times that by two in one dose, right? But he actually took two of those 15 mLs twice. So really it's times four. Does that make sense? So our total is 1300 milligrams of acetaminophen. So 
he took a lot of acetaminophen so far. I don't know if you guys agree. Did he follow the instructions on the nighttime relief label? Look at the directions on the bottom right. So he's over 12 years, right? So he was supposed to take 30 mLs every six hours. Um, do not exceed four doses per 24 hours. Did he follow the directions? Um, Bisley says yes. Okay. He's certainly under the maximum, right? Four doses per 24 hours, because he, well, he's at the maximum. He took essentially four doses. Um, but uh, he, he did uh, take it one hour after his first dose. And the directions say every six hours. Okay. So um, he didn't quite follow the directions on the nighttime relief. Uh, so let's get to the last page here. Page number seven. I want to at least end with this page so we we can actually conclude with what what was going on with our friend. So Tylenol is known to cause liver liver toxicity, okay? But it's an ingredient in many 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 overlapping OTC products and prescription products too. And it's way too easy to overdose on Tylenol and the effects can be lethal. Now the maximum amount of Tylenol you can take per day on this activity, it says four grams, which is 4,000 milligrams, but actually in clinical practice, we go more with three grams, which is 3,000 milligrams. Uh, and this, this activity says for anyone over 110 pounds. Um, but either way, let's calculate how much Tylenol total, how much acetaminophen total our friend took today. So this is a recap of what we already calculated. 4,000 milligrams of extra strength pain reliever, 2,600 of adult cold and flu, 1,300 of nighttime relief. Wow, he took 7,900 milligrams of acetaminophen. That's a lot of acetaminophen. Did he stay under the maximum per, per day? I see a comment, he is gonna die. He, he very well could, he could for sure. We're gonna to try to save him. Um, he's, he's overdosed, right? He's over the 4,000 milligrams per day. Um, so this is not okay. And it's so easy to overdose on acetaminophen with a combination of products. Now, I'm not gonna walk you through this next question, but I want you to think about this after the session's over. Um, how easy it is to take more acetaminophen than you really should. And it's a common problem that happens in ERs and medicine. Um, and this is really becoming, or it's already a big problem and it's uh, somehow not getting that much better. Um, I have a comment, he is also not an adult. He is not an adult, but a lot, a lot of the medicines are dosed as an adult. And I think he is over 110 pounds. So anyone over 12, most often is taking an adult dose of medicine. And uh, he is over 110 pounds. So he is in this category of, according to activity, 4,000 milligrams a day. But really, in our practice, it's 3,000 milligrams a day. I can't go further into the activity, guys, because I am out of time. Um, but I did want to say a few things. Farm techs, you know, in the area, uh, their starting wage is pretty good. They're in high demand. And pharmacy in general has... Um, a lot of opportunities for a variety of types of practice out there. And Washington State is one of the highest paying for pharmacy technicians. Um, I can't show you the video for our program. I, I obviously went too long for the case, um, but North Seattle College has more information on our website. And we'll have to skip this fun trivia about the Gila monster. How much time do I have left? One minute? Ah. Um, yeah. I hope you guys have some new tools in your pocket to look into the future to see what you might want to do. Uh, we have pharmacy programs at UW, at Wazoo. I'm at North Seattle College, but after you finish my program at North Seattle College, there are options for you to move on to UW and Wazoo and even do like a PA program at UW as well. Um, it was a pleasure to meet you guys.
and good luck with your futures. And I hope you have time to go through this activity. I, I, I think it really requires like two hours of activity, but um, if I come back next year, maybe I can do more.